Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ones Ready Podcast. You are in the team room. You've got Trent and I, and then we also have Wes Bryant. Appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You were recommended by Troy Bowers. Um, not that not that uh, I didn't know who you were anyway, but it was funny. He he pinged me on uh, on LinkedIn. It was like, dude, you got to get Wes on. He's done that. He's done that with a couple people now. So awesome. <laughs> I'm yeah, like, a- you've done that, but yet you haven't come on yet. I know he should come on. He yeah, should, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a good friend. We were he he worked with me in the fire shop his last couple of years, which were right about towards the end of my career as well. And we just had a great time. Yeah, man. Um, so, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, came over from the Navy. Um, I think he was a hard hat dude, right? Oh yeah. I forgot about that. I think so. Yeah. You gotta, yeah. You gotta ask him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool dude. Well, why don't we, uh, go through your background a little bit. Tell us about yourself and then how you found your, how you found your way into aspect war. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've kind of, uh, muddled background, if you will, in uh, coming up in the Air Force, because I came in, uh, came in, you know, the whole guaranteed PJ thing in 1998. <laughs> and uh, went through, um, <clears throat> went through Indoc, actually went through with, gosh, um, Hughes and Depew, you know, ended mm-hmm. up being prominent uh, Stowe's, um, you know, quite a few other guys that are, that are well known now. Graduated uh, in doc, kind of just barely, you know, like, like a lot of guys, I was like, I had acute Achilles tendonitis. So I was like, stress popping. fractures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. I mean, one of the guys, this guy, Steve Renoso, I don't know if you uh, know him or know of him, he, I mean, he was like the five minute mile man up to the end. And he ran himself to l- literal fractures. So he was, he was casted up for a few months right after in doc. Um, Jeez, but no, it was a, I mean, great time looking back in other ways, but, you know, I went to dive school and I don't know if you guys remember or felt the same way. I think, I think the pre scuba stuff now, they do a better job of prepping you for, um, what you're actually going to do in dive school, not just the underwater stuff. Indoc was like, we were great underwater, um, and all those underwater tasks. But when it came to all the tasks we'd learn in, um, SWUFO, in army dive school at that time, you know, guys were underprepared really. So we had a lot of guys failing out for the infamous safety violation. Um, of course, which I was one of them. I failed out of all things for ditch and Don with tanks because I didn't get my procedures <laughs> right. It was the dumbest. Wow, that's way. usually one man or two man comp that gets, yeah. gets guys. Yeah. And I had, uh, and it was those little one inch straps. You had to do a two finger quick release. My strap came undone, which everybody's do- did at the time. And I didn't put in the quick release. That was my second go. Because my first go, I just screwed the whole process up. <laughs> um, and then, you know, failed out and, and uh, <clears throat> got the the kind of <clears throat> the typical treatment back then for failing out. You're a big piece of crap. Um, which I don't hold any, it's, it's just how it went. I don't hold anything against anyone. Yeah, yeah. You know, then I get I got pissed off after a few weeks of that. I was being kind of treated worse than an in-doc. Um, yeah. for failing at dive school and so just out of emotion i was like see ya and that's what brought me into tac p initially the tac p recruiter was right there at medina um saying hey come on over here uh and i'd already hey, heard about it hey my, buddy yeah yeah <laughs> um, my recruiter uh coming in like you know at my my back in oregon he was actually a tac p strangely enough so i'd heard about it um so yeah i went there uh you know, pushed through tech P tech school, and then, uh, went up to my first duty station up in, um, Northern New York at the, the 10th mountain division, you know, and lived the life of that, of the conventional infantry tech P, which was pretty great and pretty, pretty hard. You know, you're roughing it out there with the, with the grunts. And, um, uh, from there I actually went through quite a few schools, air assault. I went through a a cold weather course that was kind of pretty brutal up there during, during winter went up through pre-ranger um and then i i kind of because i had failed dive school i was so upset about it um mm-hmm. for years uh me and a buddy dave wilcoxon he's a really good friend of mine we went through in doc together um and then 
went, failed out of the pipeline together and after failing dive school and then went to ACP. Um, we both actually worked our way for a year. We trained together for like three years while being tack peas up there at drum to get with the sole intention of going back to dive school. We're like, all right, we're at least going to go to dive school, if not go back to the pipeline. And, um, uh, and we did that we actually got, we went permissive. We worked permissive slots down to third group pre scuba at Bragg. Mm. Um, uh, they let us, let us in down there. And it was, uh, that was like 2001, uh, which was a, a great course, not like the hat course, like Induck is very preparatory course, but it was, was very tough. Like we did some tough underwater drills for sure. Um, but you know, professional cause it's all operators in it at the time. Yeah. Uh, We're not then, kicking in your door and waking you up in the middle of the night. Yeah. That none of thing. That. It was a, you know, it was gentlemen's in that respect. Um, you, you show up and you do your training for the day and then you leave, but yeah. we got, we got our, our butts handed to us pretty good. And it was, it was actually very good prep. Cause they, we did everything like you do when you go down to dive school, laying out your, your dive bag and doing all the uh, pre-dive inspections. Um, so we knew those drills as opposed to when we went to Indoc, which didn't really prep you for that, um, at the time. So then we worked actually permissive slots to dive school, which was a, as tack P's and conventional, you know, and we tech P wasn't under special warfare at the time. Yeah. The, the fight that we had, the fights that we had to go through to do that were pretty unbelievable. But, um, and I don't know how we did it as like young senior airmen at the time. Um, but, uh, we it, dive school was all about it. Um, it was the kind of the tack P chain of command that we had to fight to get down there, but we ended up doing it. We ended up getting down there, like within, you know, when you go to a pre scuba, I don't know if you remember, you have six months from the time you get through that pre scuba to, uh, to go to dive school. And we, we yeah. did, like right at the last month we got in, paid our way down. We thought we were going to have to pay for everything down there, but dive school ended up covering our building and food and everything. And, um, <laughs> That's Strangely cool. enough, I, yeah, I, uh, I of course failed one man comp and <laughs> that, <laughs> that one, that was for the whammy knot. Um, and oh, I, yeah. I was freaking myself out, I, like looking back because it, I had spent so long prepping. Um, uh, but you know, I passed the next day and, and then graduated me and Dave Wilcox and both graduated dive school and, uh, you know, went on from there. I, gosh, I could probably talk for the next hour on what happened there, but I ended up shortly after going back to the PJ pipeline. Dave ended up becoming a PJ, um, still as a PJ now, it works at a, I think at, at a ACC as a functional, yep. um, you know, made a lot of great friends and, and at, during both times that it was in the pipeline, but I actually ended up leaving the pipeline again, uh, during PJU. And that was, uh, largely my own decision. It was, uh, I just realized I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I wanted to go back and after, really after that. all that, after all that, it's really ridiculous. If I had to go back, I'd be like, figure out what you want to do, man. Like knock this crap. Off. I spent so long training for, for a certain thing. And then ended up going in a different direction, but all that helped me as a, as a tech B and then a soft tech B in the STS. Um, so I went back as a 2000, Three went right back to TACP, went to conventional again, became a JTAC within six months and was in Iraq. And I was like, happy as could be. I mean, I was working conventional forces, but, um, you know, deployments to Iraq and then Afghanistan. And then I worked my way into, um, selection for ST TACP and, uh, went there by 2011, took a, a few years, but. Was it just, you needed to get that monkey off your back? You know what I, I mean? Like. I think you so proved that you could, and then you were like, but I don't want to anymore. Like you actually had the space to like, think about if you wanted to anymore. And then you had this other experience. Yeah. You're like maybe I am attack P maybe that's not like yeah. a bad thing. No, that, that was it. I, I, we went through the, actually the first paramedic course in house in PJU. We were, I was a part of that uh, course. Um, and during it, I realized I didn't really like medicine that much. There's a lot of guys that felt like that. I mean, a lot of guys that go in and even become deltas and SF feel that way too. Um, but I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to stick it out. I, pro I, I might still love this stuff, but, uh, by the time I got to PJU and we, we were starting the medical exercises, I realized, you know, it just wasn't something I enjoy. I saw myself doing 
or really enjoyed doing as a career. Um, and then I was talking to my buddies, you know, at that time we had, we were in Afghanistan, we had invaded Iraq. Um, and my, I've got buddies, you know, that I'm talking to that had been in there dropping bombs and killing people as, as romads and JTACs. Um, and so I was like, they're like, bro, you're still in AETC again. Yeah. Like yeah. we are over here schwacking the enemy. What are you yeah. doing with your life? <laughs> That's how I felt. And then, then I, I just really had to come to Jesus, so to speak of like, what do I really want to do if I see myself on the battlefield? And it was, it was, uh, calling in strikes is, is killing dudes, frankly. Um, but, uh, and, and that's good. Cause I ended up, you know, realized what I wanted to do. And I think I, you know, at least somewhat or hopefully excelled at that. And I wouldn't have been as good of a PJ cause I didn't have the passion for it. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, you can't, you can't just roll in doing medicine and stuff like that. And, and as a, probably a receiver of said medis medical care, I don't necessarily know that I want you to um, yeah. be practicing <laughs> medicine on me if you're just kind of like, eh, I'm going to phone this one in. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the true story is they did a room inspection. You didn't have a hacky sack and they were like, bro, like, what are you even Wait, doing? What's here? your deal? <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the, um, the ASOS you were at up in New York, was that, was that airborne? Uh, was it? Uh, you know, because the the conventional yeah. tech P units for for the audience out there, there's there's different ones. You know, there's not every every um, army brigade and stuff like that is airborne or, or armor or light infantry or whatever. So, which one were you supporting? Um, I, we were attached to the Tenth Mountain Division. Okay. Um, Twentieth ASOS up there, and and actually when so the Tenth Mountain Division was the one that was uh, involved in Anaconda. That was the conventional piece of Anaconda. So. I missed deploying to Anaconda just because I was, I think it was B flight. We had A and B flight at the time was, you know, calling them flights, which never made sense to me, but, um, <laughs> B flight is ended up deploying, you know, in the first few, few weeks there in Afghanistan, because we all thought at the time it was going to be just a soft mission and they were going to be in and out. And so we all thought, oh, you guys are just going to go there and, and sit around for a while. And then soft's going to pull out. We're going to, you know, schwack some Taliban. We're all going to pull out. You know, and then Anaconda happened like their last, I think their last two weeks of their deployment. Um, if I remember right, we got, we had, gosh, two silver stars out of that, out of the guys that deployed from uh, 20th ASOS. And, was uh, that uh, was that with uh, Shropshire and those guys? Or was that? Um, that was late. Those guys, were, I thought, they, thought his was in Iraq. But don't it may have them. been. I. It, it, that's the thing is like you get you get these guys that win you know flying crosses and or yeah. you know air force crosses and and silver stars and stuff like that and they're like you can kind of place where they're at. They, there's not like there's a ton of them. You yeah. Know? You got freaking yeah. guys yeah. like TC that's out here with two of them because he's not sharing the wealth. <laughs> Because he's seven feet tall, he needed two of them. All right, like he's like <laughs> three men in one. I know. Yeah, complete, complete legends. Yeah. Um, so you finally got downrange to drop bombs. How was that? Yeah, that was a uh, yeah. I missed you know I missed Afghanistan because that that was um gosh we went to dive school in January of two thousand two, and then went to the pipeline. I was there. I was gone in the pipeline for um a good two to three years. I so my first deployment ended up being Iraq in two thousand four. Okay. Um, right outside right, southern Iraq or, or southern Baghdad in an area called Mamadia. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and it was right at we can't. So when I came in, our unit had just um, had just supported the battle for Fallujah. So I replaced all those all our guys that that had been in that. And that was some some uh, some bad fighting. Like you know, and then that was a time when the demand for JTACs on the soft teams was increasing so much that, uh, you know, that's why ST started pulling from conventional TACP. We had a couple guys attached to, uh, to Marine recon units, um, attached to the, the regular Marines and then the army, of course. Um, but yeah, that was just some craziness all the way around, uh, in Fallujah. But of course I missed that. So now I'm like pissed off again. I'm like, I feel like I'm missing everything. <laughs> 
but uh, it, it was a good deployment. It wasn't, wasn't too kinetic, um, but I learned a lot of, uh, you know, joint command and control, learned how to be a, that senior JTAC at like battalion up to division level. Um, did a couple drops um, out in, in South Baghdad, uh, which were good. I actually had one that was um, um, terminally guided with a ground laser. So I'm one of the nice. few that can say I actually use yeah, soft lamb and ground and laser in. Yeah, no kidding. As much as we practice it, as much as yeah. we used to practice it on an OP and, and really dive in on it and guys, God, you got to get this right. There's not that many dudes that have actually had to do it. No, no. And that was because it, we weren't under fire at that time. Um, it was a more, it was a kind of a psychological operation where there was this uh, big former radio station out there um, in the middle of, uh, kind of in a more rural area. Um, and it was being used, uh, as a, um, uh, interrogation and torture site. So we went, we went there, pulled out a bunch of bodies that had been tortured and killed and, um, and then blew the building, which was like three feet of concrete and rebar, um, Jeez. with quite a few 2000 pound bombs. So we prepped for it, you know, we did laser guided, we did GPS. And then one of the, the picture of that was floating around on the media. Cause we had combat camera out there, um, floating around on the media for a while. You can probably still find it if you Google it, but it's uh, a really good picture. And you see the second bomb coming down after the first explosion. And you see like perfectly square pieces of concrete building all coming out. It's really interesting. <laughs> I'm going to take a note on that and look yeah. that one up. Yeah. It sounds like their their building <laughs> technique is like me with knots. Like if you can't tie a knot, tie a lot. They're like, ah, just more concrete and rebar. It's yeah. fine. Just put yeah. more of it on there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, when did you like get to to the point where you got everything you wanted? Because it sounds like you were you're missing all the good stuff, you know. But like you're learning a lot, and I think one of the things about TACP that people, mm -hmm. uh, at least folks that are not in, don't understand, and I don't fully understand it, is that command and control piece. Um, and, and how important that is. And actually, before we get to kinetic, can you kind of explain why that's so important to have the Air Force guys in there with the Army guys oh, yeah. and working that whole piece? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, really, you know, that Air Force guy was created as a, a the Air Force JTAC or what we used to be called Ford Air Controller um, was put on the ground as that liaison, that air power liaison uh, between everything air and everything ground with these, these army ground maneuver units. Um, and, you know, you, even the best, the, the best army ground commander, at least through my experience with, with all this great joint appreciation and understanding still does not speak air. So we were the guys that spoke both air and ground spoke both in air force and army essentially. Um, and you're there, uh, not just to, control close air support. That's like the end, you know, the 1% of your job. You're there as an, an, an advisor and an air power integrator um, into the, you know, as we call it, the ground force commanders schema maneuver. And, you know, even there's been a push for, for more Army JTACs, but first in Army SF, and then now even to get a, get programs going in, in conventional, that's been talked about at least for a while. And uh, though, though that's positive, I don't think you'll ever see the same um, benefit or, you know, the, the same really end result or capability as putting an Air Force guy in there. It just won't be the same um, because, you know, the two, the, the two services just think entirely differently. And then mm -hmm. TACPs and controllers themselves think entirely differently. Like, like they're grown up to be that in-between and you can't replace that with just a green suitor going in. Well, um, well and the Air it, Force guys kind of exist outside of the Army chain of command too, which I think is very yeah. helpful because, like, you'll you'll find these stories of these like senior airmen telling these O fives, like, "Hey, no, like they're, they're kind of like on the same level, trying to like help them make these decisions." Which there's no Army E four uh, in that chain of command. Usually, that's going to be like, "Hey, sir, no, you you shouldn't do that. Really, that's a terrible idea." You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. You have uh, you have a little more, you know, what kind of power would you call it? Um, it? They don't, they can't lord their their command over you in the same way they can a green suitor. 
Um, you're kind of that outside entity that though they may crap on you every once in a while or a lot, um, especially when you're with <laughs> conventional forces. And I'll say specifically the Sergeant Major of any conventional force unit, you're going to get shit on. Um, but you'll get listened to a lot more, yeah, than than some Army E4. Yep. Like, all right, that's, yeah. that's the JTAC, that's the Air Force liaison. Um, and you also have that power to say, um, you, you know, JTACs are like, we used to call them the mini JAGs, mini lawyers. Uh, it, we know the ROE often better than anyone in that staff, uh, including sometimes the lawyers, frankly, if it's a, lot, a young JAG. Um, and, uh, you know, that capability to say, yeah, this is legal. Actually, we should strike here or no, this is not, this is not a good strike um, because, you know, your, your supported unit can get overzealous um, or, or be timid. And then so can JTAC sometimes JTACs can, you, you know, we all, we all have to work together, making those decisions of where, we're, what we're going to target, what we're going to strike. Oh yeah. Why. I never, I never realized the, my first moment, I didn't realize the importance of knowing the ROEs like, mm. like very, very detailed. And, and I mean, it's first, first deployment. So of course I don't, you know, but, um, yeah you you quickly realize oh i need to like these roes um although can be very constraining at times um mm -hmm. if you know them well enough and you know how to read a situation or whatever is going on uh they can they can end up helping you a lot and helping you and protecting you whenever somebody wants to come in and do a 156 investigation on a drop or something like that that you've done and you're also keeping that you know O O two or uh O three O four or even O six out of out of jail by going like, hey man, like, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. I, as much as you want to, we cannot do this. Yeah. Or maybe we don't need to. You know, sure, you only want to drop a you know a GBU twelve or a, or GBU fifty four on this, but really you're going to need a lot more. Um. So instead of slinging you know four GBU fifty fours into it, why don't we just you know, sling a 31 in there and, and call it good. <laughs> you yeah, know, exactly. give me that big one. But like, that's to me, that's the problem with like the, the army and on all these other units trying to stand up their own JTAC programs. Cause even from like my career field, right. There mm. were a lot of years where guys would like, well, why don't we just become JTACs? Cause we only see the end result, right? Like we only see the end. And it wasn't until like, like, yeah, my, my second deployment, I sat down with uh, GZ actually, and I was like in his room and he was just like sitting there for hours reviewing all the paperwork and all the updates to the ROEs and all the other stuff mm -hmm. that he has to know to be the kind of JTAC that I'm accustomed to being around the, the TAC P's and the, the combat controllers. And it, it finally dawned on me how much it takes to do that job the way y'all do that job effectively. And then I, you know, like I was always going back to my guys being like, you don't want, you don't want the smoke. You don't want it. This is yeah. way, this is like, this is a full-time job. If it's not a full-time job, you're not going to have the same effects as these guys. You know what I mean? So yeah. It just doesn't work as a, a as an add on, at least not to the way that everybody's used to it from GWAT. Yeah, no, not at all. And that that happened, you know, with our with our SF JTACs. That usually we, we'd show up. You know, we had some just solid ones out there, obviously. Um, but even even the guys that were really good, it was still their secondary, even their tertiary duty. And you'd show up, and they'd be like, "Here, take it." Um, you know, I don't think I ever heard a case where I, where a controller or attack P showed up um, to a team, you know, that had at the time, you know, the Anarchy JTAC in, uh, in, um, in Afghanistan specifically. And, uh, and that guy said, no, I'm going to be the lead JTAC. I can't, it, I'm sure it happened at some point, but usually they were like, please take it. I can't handle this. <laughs> well, guess what? I'm out here and they put me out here. So no, I'm, I'm the lead JTAC. And that's yeah. usually at E E seven or E eight say that too. Yeah. <laughs> to you know, it's just that it, it is though. You the the services act differently. And and it's it's kind of why, you know, the going going way back, why the Air Force separated from the Army, because even now, whenever mm -hmm. so go into your kind of um kinetic strike cell um, you know, background that you have <clears throat> You know, much must much of that is owned by the army, and seeing them go through all the different lines of of 
ISR support and CAS support and stuff like that and saying, we want this, we want this, we want this as an Air Force guy, as a JTAG going, hmm. Guys, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do this. I would. I would plug this here because this is going to have better sensors, or it's going to have better playtime, or or the distance. And because because being Air Force, because being a JTAC, I I just have that background. It's not that I'm I'm better at it. It's just that I have that background, and I can kind of understand how those planes and those assets, and how lines and generation of lines with maintenance works. Um, you just kind of have a better understanding of it mm -hmm. than, than a lot of those dudes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They would, uh, be asking for the world on a routine basis. <laughs> <laughs> just surge lines, just constant surge yeah. lines. I'm like, guys, like a surge is, is supposed to be a temporary thing. Not, not just, Hey, well, that's, that's what it is. And we're just going to keep mm -hmm. doing it. Because you do have people on the other end of those that are generating those planes that, uh, yeah, <laughs> they're on. Yeah, and, and, you know, in addition to that, that kind of, um, I think we we kind of forget that it was only later, later in GWAT where ground commanders, you know, down to that young youngest lieutenant were really being taught and like reinforced um, uh, to to be judicious in their kinetic operations, whether it be ground or air fires. Um, and, uh, you know, early on, it's like, if we, these guys go in and they want to do their job, let's just basically kill everything that's in front of us. And so without that JTAC, who's, you know, part of our mission is literally, um, safeguarding civilians is limiting collateral damage. Um, I just can imagine how much more, uh, <clears throat> how much more destruction would have taken place without the, the, that didn't need to happen, you know, without the yeah, yeah. air force attack on the ground. Um, <laughs> and then we went in a totally opposite direction because we had we had incidents through the years, and then ground commanders showed up, and they were like, "Whoa, we're not doing any strikes, like unless I'm being chained down and tortured, nobody's dropping," kind of thing. Um, what do you think you know, that was rooted in? Yeah, I mean, guys were being told like you have an incident and you're like, you're no longer in command. So, you know, you had these young, or this happened when I was with SF teams starting in the, the 2000 teens. Um, this was, this was really a big deal, especially in Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, guys were literally being told from their chain of command, you have a, a, a bad strike. You do, you make a bad decision as far as greater around five, yeah, you're done. So their careers, you know, let alone, you know, they knew that, that, potentially UCMJ could also happen. But the first thing they thought about was at least I'm going to lose my career. Like my whole track as an SF officer mm. is gone. And, you know, there, of course, everybody's concerned. We don't want to do the wrong thing anyway. Um, you know, I, I haven't met a one, uh, one war fighter that I was ever deployed with. It was like, yeah, let's go kill civilians. Um, like nobody wants <laughs> yeah. that on their conscious, of course. But what's even more compelling for guys in the moment is like, if I even have something that even came close to killing civilians, um, cause it was a bad call then I'm, I'm fired. Uh, and then, so now I fast forward and you have incidents like, um, uh, what happened in Marja, uh, down in the, in the South in, uh, gosh, was that 2016 now? Yeah. Um, uh, and that was following the the bad strikes on Kunduz, on the hospital in Kunduz, you know, which was a completely uh, bad call, but it was fog of war, really. That was like the definition of fog of war. Um, and, uh, you know, that was huge in the news and huge all the way up to the administration. And then you, you fast forward a few months and you had this big operation of Marja where ground commanders and including down up to the, the task force were just timid to, uh, to strike. And you had guys killed because of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's hard to explain to folks too, that like Afghanistan wasn't like the same the whole way through, you mm -hmm. know, it was like, Hey, I think we've all seen the memes like G watt, like 2001 to 2000, whatever, like 2010 as like one person. And then like the rest of it's yeah. a, a totally different person. Cause like it did, it changed. Things changed, administrations changed, like, you know, like, 
guys had grown up in the war or not grown up in the war making decisions and and it changes a lot of things about it you know like if it's like your eighth rotation like are you going to be more timid or are you going to be more aggressive mm-hmm. like that the, the kind of permeates across all things and depending on on who your boss is at the time like it can be a totally different experience one rotation to the next oh yeah you had yeah we would sh- start showing up to teams that you know these, these guys had been we had been back and forth to a bunch of deployments we had guys that had been you know, going there from the start, guys that were on the invasion. Now they're like team sergeants kind of thing. And they're like, man, I'm just doing, we're doing the minimum we have to do because Afghanistan's about to end and I'm not going to lose any of my guys. Um, and then, though I can understand that on one hand, every time we're on the ground in Afghanistan and, and anyone, especially with a team forward, you know, we're doing the VSO, Village Stability Operations, we stopped. Um, really interacting and stopped going out, um, even doing, even doing just standard patrols, you know, incidents of violence on mm-hmm. us and our partner forces increased like exponentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because then they're like, well, I got these dudes in my country. You're just sitting here squatting and you've promised me that you're going to do this and that for, for my village. And you're sitting on your asses in the fob. Like, what are, yeah. what are you doing here? Just yeah. fuck, do something or leave. Yep. Yeah, I remember one team, you know, that I had that issue with, and I was in FOB Connolly in Eastern in uh, Nagarhar. Tiny little FOB is just us, and then uh, you know, Afghan uh, police that we were training to you know, securing us around on the outside. But we had a, we actually had an Afghan uh, special forces team, and a legitimate special forces team that we had, as, as the U.S. had stood up. So that was cool. So we were working joint ops with them, but still very tiny. And I remember this one team. I had, was it three teams on that rotation? Because you know how we'd, we'd come in offset and then mm-hmm. we just stay there while other teams came in, <laughs> um, and vice versa. Like they'd have two or three JTACs during their rotation sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they scaled way back compared to the last team, the, the first like month or two. And man, we were getting like drive bys on the literally drive by RPGs <laughs> to the FOP. Like one of our, one of our <laughs> uplift guys. The conventional dudes that, that kind of call them uplift, you know, that secure. Um, I mean, for the for the watchers, that uh, you know, they're there as more security, and they they're part of the team. They help uh, entire operation. But he was on on guard that night, and he's up in a tower, and an RPG literally hit the sandbags like a few feet below him. Um, and we're, we're getting that routinely, like AK fire and RPGs. And so finally the team's like, okay, I guess we have to go out and start being aggressive again. <laughs> Jeez. Can't sit on our ass anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Just wonder what that drive-by conversation's like. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Got a hold of some like American movies and they're like, we can do this. <laughs> yes. We can. It's like straight out of Compton, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Well, <clears throat> let's... um. Let's dive into some of the the kinetic strike cell stuff, because um, that that was not a a a real thing, a doctrinal kind of thing back back in the day. That definitely seemed like it came around, and I'm probably gonna mess up my my dates, but that seems like that came around in kind of the the o nine kind of thing. But I I could be I could be way off. Maybe it was happening beforehand. I think I know. Um... <clears throat> No guys were doing like remotely controlled strikes, even as of the invasion, um, uh, the Iraq invasion. Uh, Cause you know, I knew a guy that was, um, at core level and he had done some like some really what we'd call strategic strikes during the invasion. But yeah, it wasn't, there was, there was nothing set into either TTP or doctrine as far as like a strike cell capability yeah. until, um, until about 2014 when ISIS, uh, came onto the scene. Now, we were doing a bunch of, you know, especially specifically ta- elements. We're doing a lot of um, high value targeting. Um, but I'd say that, but that wasn't locked down into any, you know, true kind of strike cell TTP yet. Yeah. Um, it was just, I remember, I, I remember going to my first one and it was kind of like, it was just weird. For me, having yeah. having always been out on the ground, and mm-hmm. now I've got you know a wall of TVs and all this data, and I'm like, how do I know that that is actually 
what I'm supposed to be looking at. You know, the grids match, but like, I don't, it, it's just, a, it's a weird thing, a weird mindset shift from, from like me who had always been out there, always on the ground, whether, you know, on a hill or like in it um, mm-hmm. to now staring at screens. That was just a weird transition for me. Yeah. It, I, I'd say it was um, for us to and but that's one of the things that made us, you know, when we stood up uh, uh, the Baghdad strike cell in 2014, we went in against, um, against the, the uprise of ISIS and uh, several cells were stood up. There was an NBC strike cell initially, and then we took that over to the, to buy up Baghdad international airport where the task force was stood up ours under general Batard, who's a GIFLIC guy at the time, the ground commander of Iraq. And then, uh, you know, elements were, were standing up a strike cell up in the north. Um, and, you know, when we did that, I think the success for all of us, TACPs, controllers, or conventional TACPs at the embassy, was because we had grown up in GWA and been forward doing it. Um, and it was, I remember it being very frustrating because we all wanted to, like, go out and you know, kill dudes. Like, especially after years in GWA and everybody getting you know, kind of disillusioned by, or should we really be fighting these guys anymore? Like, come on, we've done, you know, it's been so many years and now some uh, times we're like, we're tar- we're fighting what seem like farmers who are just pissed off at us because we've been here so long. Um, that was, that became the mindset. Now we get ISIS and we're watching them literally do like World War II Nazi style genocide on, on our drone feed up in Sinjar. Yeah. And so we're like motivated. This is, this is a, a real enemy again that we really feel like we need to go kill and we want to go kill them. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, we had to, then we got that mandate from Obama, which I think, you know, had good reason from the Obama administration to, uh, to not do boots on the ground, to do a, a strike campaign. And, um, you know, politics of that, either way, we have to, we have to carry out that, that mandate. Right. And that's what yeah. we, we ended up doing. Um, so I, I yeah, remember a, uh, a, yeah. a, a senior JTAC from the two, three coming back from, from one of those rotations. I think when it was first getting stood up out there yeah, and he had some, some choice words about how things worked or didn't work, you know, you know, like, but like, you know, he'd been through a lot G Watt and it was used to the things being a certain way. And it's like, then he went to the strike cell and was just like, you know, there was a lot of beeps in that, in those conversations. And he came back and he was very upset, but, but yeah, but like, <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. No, but like, I mean, we were over there in like 15, you know, setting up. And yeah, there was a lot of frustration about the whole ISIS thing and, and everything yeah. that was going on. But like, I think a lot of setup got, got put into place and everybody was ready in like 16, kind of when the, the gloves came off. Yeah. It, we, we, uh, I'd say those initial first months, you know, against ISIS in 2014, about what, July, when, uh, when the gloves came off initially and that was kicked off largely from the Obama administration, seeing the footage of the genocide that took place in Sinjar and, and finally saying, all right, we're going to, we're going to start actually going kinetic. Um, and those first few months, which I was a part of were great. I mean, we were, we were, we, we stood up the biop strike cell in a little trailer. It was just totally ad hoc. And there was only gosh, 10 to 15 people, you know, men and women on the, on the floor at any one point. We made sure we had like three JTACs at any one moment sitting there at the front, one, one lead and two, um, two junior, if you will, um, that we had quite a few senior guys like, uh, like, um, uh, Adam Cooper, for example, Josh <laughs> Craig. Um, so I was a senior, you know, by, by rank at the time as a master sergeant, uh, they were both techs, but you know, we were all equal and experience that so we all kind of really helped stand that up together. I'd say I wasn't, um, I was going to say Coop's name, but you, you did it. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. was the one that was really angry. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> we were both angry in our own way. I, yeah. I have a little story in, uh, in hunting the caliphate about the you know, interaction between men, me and him. Yeah. Little fight that we had. Yeah. Well, let's go into that then, because you do, ha- you did author uh, a book called hunting the caliphate and um it's been it's been very popular among the the community and the folks that are kind of interested in that that the things that we were doing as a as a community 
um, back then. So why don't we go into that a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I, I hadn't planned on, um, writing a book about experiences. Uh, I actually, when I was in, I always wrote, um, growing up, I planned on writing something. I envisioned myself like getting out and writing like fantasy or something. Never even wanted to, I wanted to get out and just not even think about military anymore. Mm. Like a lot of us do. (laughs) (laughs) Done. Um, but general Batard, he was the, the ground force commander in Iraq during, during that push into Baghdad, um, during those initial few months. He was the one that, you know, uh, conventional TACP units stood up the initial strike cell at the, at the embassy, um, those first like few weeks under him. And then he pulled that over to, to the Baghdad International Airport, pulled the soft task force in, um, and then we went from there, kind of grew it, grew operations. Um, and uh, had a good relationship, a very professional relationship. It wasn't like, hey, bro. But honestly, he was, you know, I had remembered at the time during working under him, he was literally the best officer, not even general, but officer at all that I had ever worked under. I mean, the way, not just his ability and his, um, his, uh, like intelligence and understanding of the battlefield, but the way he treated all of us was just pretty damn badass. Like he would come in and we had, you know, this great army, uh, uh, artillery officer, Colonel Keo, um, that was, that was in the director of the strike cell technically, but, uh, and, and solid dude, even though we fought quite a bit, you know, I have a, a story in there about, uh, arguing with him about how we're going to prosecute a strike, for example, but general Patar would come in on the floor and he would go right to whoever was the lead JTAC before go- going to Colonel Keo, which pissed Colonel Keo off, which I understand, you know, looking back, <laughs> we'd come right in and ask us what's going on. And then he'd go talk to Colonel Keogh and get his take. Um, that's, that was the kind of, kind of general that he was. And, you know, that was a, you, we had a, a two star and he was our target engagement authority and he was there most of the time. Like he delegated it to sometimes to Colonel Keogh, sometimes to a couple other, uh, one stars that would come in. But, uh, you know, after, after that time in Iraq, let's see, that was, uh, 2015, I went and ran a, a strike operations in Syria um, from Jordan at the time, uh, which was classified. But now that's all open that we were you know, operating out of Jordan and Turkey, of course. And everybody knows CIA was running all over the place. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't put, couldn't put that in the book. They, When you see other intelligence entity that's talking about the CIA, but now everybody knows it's all over open source. So, um, you know, that's long ago history, essentially. And then, uh, and then I had the opportunity to run, operate, be the O one, and run operations in the task force in Afghanistan. My last year, um, my last real operational year, twenty seventeen, and it was right about then. This is towards the end of twenty sixteen. The general Batard reached out and said, "Hey, I'm about to retire, and I'm doing a, I'm writing because he, he's a historian by, by education. He's got a master's in history. He's like, I, I want to do a, a history book on the first few months against ISIS." will you add something to it? And, uh, so I sent him, I took a couple of weeks and I sent him, you know, I'm like, Oh, this is my chance. This is going to be great to be a part of this. Um, you know, have, have a, a few of my words and a real history on, on what we did. And when I sent that back, he, I remember he called me and I was on a, a, um, uh, cast training, uh, trip up in Warren Grove, New Jersey, Warren Grove bombing range. And I rem- remember it pretty vividly because I was shocked. He called me and said, hey, Wes, I love your material. It's just, it's awesome stuff about, you know, what we did out there. And I realized I've been having a really hard time um, really effectively speaking on the JTAC piece in this book. And I've got, I've got an agent already. I've got a, a guy that's helping, helping me put this together. How would you like to come in 50-50 and and we do this jointly. You be the JTAC, I be the general, and we, we talk about, you know, what we did. And that kicked off about a three-year process of of uh, writing and hey. compilation and, and friendship. He ended up, you know, to this day, he's a kind of consider him a, a an uncle, so to speak. He really helped mentor me, helped me in my transition. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, we did the book together, and that was a great experience and hopefully, you know, added added a piece of that history that 
might have been missing. Um, yeah, that was the evolution of of the of the writing of the book. Anyway, it, it, so was he like having to come in and like edit out all of your f words, or how did that work? <laughs> um, that, that's a, that is a great question, and he would love that question because yes, my initial takes, um, a lot of them were even angrier than what it might come across in there. Um, yeah. Uh, so you know, we had a, initially we had a great guy, a ghostwriter, one of those guys that kind of helps you when you, when you haven't written anything like that, helps you put it together, helps you reshape things. And, uh, you know, he mentioned that too, a lot of, a lot of emotion in mine, um, in my portion. And, but I ended up keeping that emotion in. And a lot of people say that they're like, I like the, the dichotomy between like, you're kind of angry, emotional part. And then general Petard's this like very level headed and he's the, you know, the, the looking at everything analytically kind of yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, I was a, the ang that pissed off, you know, as they say, <laughs> basically. Um, and I, I appreciated that. I still appreciate general Pitar for that. Cause a lot of these, these general officers get out and they write great books that we need to hear what they have to say. Cause they're, they've been involved in a lot. Um, but you're missing that forward enlisted piece from so many of these narratives. And I really appreciated that I got to, you know, I added my perspective. That's just one, of course, of all our joint perspectives, but at least I, we, we got some kind of enlisted perspective out there because there's a few times through the book where, you know, mine and his idea of what was happening was quite different. Um, oh yeah. The recollection of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I even talk about how, gosh, before I even met him, before we, I was working in Bahrain at the, the, um, just sort of GCC at global, uh, or Gulf cooperation council and the just of GCC in Bahrain was, was the senior element managing the task force in Baghdad. That was the first few weeks, like June and into July. And, uh, we had a real problem with ROE and I like, I, I put in the book, I hated this, whoever this general petard was because he had. Like if guys were taking fire in Baghdad, they had to get, um, approval from general Petard himself, who was at the embassy, you know, across a few miles away from where the task force was and wasn't always available because he's a general. So he's always having these meetings and bullshit and talking with Senkal. Um, so, you know, I, I had my first few weeks were spent kind of fight, not just managing the JTAX that we had pushed in at the time before I went into Baghdad, but, um, but fighting that ROE and basically trash talking this, the ground commander of Iraq, <laughs> um, who it turned out it wasn't his call anyway. Um, really? It, yeah. It was you know, from above him. Um, I don't remember what level maybe may even been like SECDA level. Cause it was so, it, it was so sensitive when we first went in those first few months, as far as, um, you know, the Obama administration did not want to send any signal that we were going back into war. And so even something that we would see as a simple, um, uh, answer as far as like our guys on the ground taking fire, all right, we're going to, we're going to strike like immediately because that's what we're used to. And that's really what should happen. That was looked at as like, okay, wait, well, let's exhaust all options. We cannot do any kind of airstrike unless it ha absolutely has to happen or else the yeah. public's going to go insane. And so that's why the approval went all the way to General Petard. Um, yeah, I, re I remember that time frame where it was uh, guys with troops in contact and the you know and they're calling back saying, hey, we're troops in contact, you know, send any send any and all air support. And then the, the dude in the on the other end would be like, well, can you break contact? Like, can you just like yeah. walk away, walk away kind of thing? It's like, do, are, are we having this conversation right now? Like there's rounds yeah. flying over my head. Like I got, I got the, the 18 deltas freaking treat, treating dudes right now. Or can yeah. I just like walk away? Come on. Yeah. And then importantly, uh, it, you probably remember this just as well. Remember we started doing these, uh, like at the two one, we started doing these, these cards, um, that, kind of were a cheat sheet of what to say when we're troops in contact mm. so that we yep. not only meet all the legal requirements, but get that approval, you know, and then we, one of them was like, we've exhausted all capability 
with small arms and organic fires. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. My God. yeah. It's funny. Cause you could, if you're on the other end of that, you're like, Oh yeah, he's definitely reading from the script. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the in like yeah. one tr one transmission, hey, we're troops in contact. We've exhausted all all means of being able to break contact. And it's you're like, all right, so cool. The nine line before the yeah, yeah. The, the jag and the strike cell is just like I heard that. I know what you're doing. You're like, well, that's what they're saying. Yeah. But there's like crazy stuff happening, right? Like the JTACs weren't allowed to talk to the aircraft directly. The JTACs on the ground. You know, there's a there's a lot of wild things that were going down during that time frame. Oh, with the strike cells? Yeah. 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 That, that was a problem for a while. Once we, uh, <clears throat> specifically up north in Kurdistan, guys started, um, you know, teams started pushing out with the Kurds at one point. That was a little, maybe within a month or two after I left. So that was into 2015 mm -hmm. when guys started finally being able to push out forward. And, um, and I remember that being an issue where, you know, the strike, once we all left, took a few months but then of course the bureaucracy came in strike cells became huge like 100 dudes in a cell at you know if if not more um if you went into a couple of these like really mm -hmm. the big one at the task force and um yeah there there were many moments of um or many instances of a, a US JTAC forward eyes on and not actually being handed the assets, which absolutely should happen every time yeah. um, with any uh, with any kind of uh, joint forward and strike cell operation. The, now, we didn't do that when we were just supporting Kurds or just supporting Iraqis or even Afghanis because we're not going to hand them coalition air power, obviously. Um, but uh, end up smoking their end up smoking their uncle because they had a disagreement with them. Yeah, that's exactly that kind of thing. Yeah, we. Yeah. <laughs> know that absolutely they don't they do not have the, even though it's their people um unless they're in like their own tribal area they just do mm -hmm. not care about the civilian populace in, in general the way that we do they're like no they good. they under they understand violence that's mm -hmm. that's what they understand and and like like i it's i'm not using hyperbole here like they people not for you guys i'm kind of saying it for the audience but they, I can't tell you how many times we would we would go out and and do a key leader engagement, and so and so, you know, one of the one of the elders is trying to telling us about this bad dude, this really bad dude, and then mm -hmm. as you start digging, you come to find out it's his it's his freaking brother or his uncle yeah. that he's trying to get, and and they just had a disagreement kind of thing, mm -hmm. and now he's trying to get his brother freaking rolled up, like yeah. by 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 you know, coalition forces, you're like, this is wild, dude. Yeah. You know, n neighbors, they didn't just have, you know, shouting matches and stuff like that. They'd roll at each other with AK 47s. Just like, yeah, I killed them. You're like, mm -hmm. Whoa, this is wild. Yeah. <laughs> Was that like know, the ultimate it. boss move? You get the Americans to go in and schwack like the person you had a, a <laughs> disagreement with over your property line. Like imagine that, like you're fighting with your neighbor and then like a bunch of dudes in black kick in your door and just kill everybody. It's like, yeah, I won. Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> We're like the the ultimate HOA. <laughs> Little half field that are poise option. <laughs> yeah, that that's a good. That reminds me of that's a good point on the flip side on the um, the whole, you know, familiar the 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 network of people that guys know in a combat zone that that the the indigenous populace. Um, uh, it's it's not it's not just like here's the bad guys and here's the good guys and we're going against each other. There's mm. just like, it's, it's similar to when we read about our own civil war where it's brother against brother often. And that army SF there, that Afghan SF team that I uh, talked about working with in uh, that was 20, summer of 2013. I remember we had, um, we had a crypto linguist attached to our team that was, you know, monitoring signals, uh, intelligence all, all around the area. That's where we were uh, hunting HVIs and, capturing quite a lot of HVIs in the area at the time. Well, he picked up communications between our SF team leader, our Afghan SF team leader on our camp. That was, they were living with us and, uh, and his cousin in the area who was Taliban. And this guy wasn't working against us. We, we never did anything to him. We just kept monitoring because he wasn't working against us. He was just telling his cousin, he would tell him like, Hey, don't be in this area tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Cause 
he knew where we were going to patrol. So he's just keeping him away from us. Um, I think we should have done something to him. I don't know. Maybe, maybe something happened a level above me, but, uh, but no, we kept just working with him and monitoring him. Um, so just strange, strange situations out there that really, but when you step back and think about it, it's not too strange at all. It's what would be happening here if we had the same scenario. You know? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, that's us versus the, the Intel, you know, the, the alphabet nerds, right? Like we're like, let's do something about this. They're like, hold on. Like, but now we have an in, you know, like we can, we can pull on this thread a little bit and see where it goes. Yeah. Or we're, we're just like, oh, do something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we, I mean, maybe that's just me. There's a time and place for both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At some point, because, you know, a, a lot of those, you know, insider threat kind of, kind of dudes that y you hear about that where the, you know, the A&W or something like that friggin', um, you know, ended up turning while they were at the range and ended up smoking a couple of dudes. And you're like, man, we knew that this guy was bad. Mm -hmm. That's, that's when it's not worth it. That's when you should have just smoked that dude, uh, or done something about it. Maybe not smoke them, but you know, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Happened yeah, way too had, often. Man, that, that incidence of green on blue that were, was rising in Afghanistan was just, it was pretty out of control. I remember like mm -hmm. 2017, um, it was my last deployment there. I was the O one at the task force. We had thirteen, uh, um, thirteen JTACs out there spread throughout the country. And I mean, God, I think we had like five or six green on blue incidents um, in my time there, which I spent four months, and then a couple more in the uh, in the uh, in the couple months after with our broad rotation. I had to leave because I had to go out process for terminal leave and retirement. But. <laughs> nice. Uh, but man, how how frustrating. Like and I don't blame all the, the whole Afghan, you know, military. There were there were so many guys that were just that were very uh patriotic Afghanistans. They wanted to change the country and they're pro us. Um and I don't know if the Taliban just did a good job of infiltrating or if you had guys that just turned or a, a combination. Um but I remember being so frustrated, you know. I think a lot of us were so frustrated that we're like, here's another reason why we shouldn't be doing this. Like they just, they're killing us now. Yeah. We never know who's going to turn and, and shoot us in the face. Well, it was, I, I mean, in their defense, I guess they would get those night letters and those night letters were terrifying. I mean, if, if you've got a whole bunch of Taliban or ISIS or who, whoever it is that are, threatening your family and have very detailed about your family. And it's just you, you don't have the backing of, you know, a, a team of soft dudes. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's scary. You know, and it's like, Hey man, you're, you, you do this, you put this here or we're going to freaking take and take your, your wife and your daughter and we're going to do things with them and we're going to kill your son. And you're like, man, that's, um, that's tough to, to say no to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same mm -hmm. thing would happen here. I mean, most all of us would mm -hmm. say like our, we're, we have loyalty to our, you know, teammates and country, but our family is the first loyalty. So I can, yeah, I can see that. It's, well, it's, it's, I mean, how, how often do we talk about how well do we actually know each other? You know, like we think mm -hmm. everybody on team that we know, like it's, and people still surprise us. So like you rotate into a country for a few months and you meet these Afghans, like you can't know everybody. So like, the the level of paranoia during those years, during the big, you know, green on blue years was, was pretty high. Cause like, you can't, you literally cannot trust anybody. I mean, we all knew that for like the, the 15 years previous, but it just took it to like a whole nother level of, of, of mistrust and making it hard to get anything done. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. but the, but then you retired. So now you're all happy. All these memories are gone. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, yeah it's, it's great, man. It's like, it's the whole, it's the 180. Yeah. <laughs> sounds sounds like you really let a lot of this go, you know, after you got out. <laughs> yeah, you think you're gonna and and you don't and then at times it um it creeps up on you like out of nowhere too. Uh and uh you know, I I don't know, there's a whole it's you look back in your career it's like I'm so proud of some things. Some things were just awesome, other things were com horrible tragedies. I would if I could go back and not experience it again i would um 
you also had like, you know, I felt like I was fighting with military chains of command my whole career. So that was tumultuous too, on top of like the traumas of war in general. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still, I'm a few years out and I still haven't figured out what the answer is as far as, um, fully transitioning. Like I'm not, I, I'm not sure that I'll ever be, um, I don't, you know, I work in defense now, which is a great, it's still corporate America, but at least you're working with other veterans and, you know, combat veterans. Um, so I'm not fully in corporate, corporate America, but I'd see you, you, you even then it, I just don't fit in there. There have been times, strangely enough, as ready as I was ready to get, as I was to retire and get out. Um, there have been times when I thought like, man, I should have stayed in and just made it to chief and just done a, a few more years. Um, Cause I just have not, there are so many times where I just did not feel like I fit in or was even going to make it um, as a civilian, yeah. you know? Yeah, I get that. I, the, 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 you kind of feel like you're just like, you know, like you had, like you you had a, a a boat with a big old motor on it like you knew where you're going you hit bunches of waves but you were used to it right like this is what i yeah. do for 20 years mm -hmm. and it kind of feels like you know someone just pulled the motor off and dropped it to the bottom of the ocean you're like well okay what am i doing like yeah. where like because like my wife and i are going through this right now we're like well what do we do now with our lives like we had like this like thing that we've been like so passionate about for 20 years like do we just get a job and take care of the kids like how does this work <laughs> yeah because you know, like, there's no one in the military like all of our friends none of them have retired before that are still in you know we have a bunch of retired friends but it's just like they're like oh you'll find your own way you're like but how i don't understand <laughs> yeah and i no, exactly and i thought you know i lied to myself and said like oh i'm i won't go through that identity crisis bullshit like i'm just gonna because i was so ready i was just at the pinnacle of pissed off and just you know, like, I'm done with it. 20 years, I'm done. Um, <laughs> and then I get out, I'm like, oh, I'm no longer a killer. I'm no longer a predator, a warrior for my country. I'm just a dude. I'm a veteran. Um, <laughs> Going to get one of those GWAT veteran hats. Yeah. Right around. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's hard. And even, you know, I've had, um, I've had fortune and being able to do things, put out the book and kind of put my voice out a little bit on, um, you know, national security stuff and all of that's based on, you know, it's not, it's based on a kind of a philanthropic outlook of, you know, I want, I, I, I appreciate being able to get that tactical level of voice out there because there's, there's not enough of them. Um, and, uh, and also it, it's a, honestly, a lot of my, the writing that I've done is a way of me processing through, mm. uh, my past and my own traumas. Um, it's really helped me, uh, um, you know, and then going into defense, like a lot of us do, it's, you, you feel some sense of like, hey, I'm still contributing. That's, that's cool, but it's just not it's at not all. The same. No, not in any stretch of the imagination. Um, and one, the greatest piece of advice, I think, yeah, Chandra Pittard gave, gave this to me because uh, I was kind of unloading the, in my first, year or two after getting out on all these subjects. And he said, well, that's all understandable, but one, you've got to, you, you've got to just not look back. You got to push forward. This is a new, a new life, a new chapter. And two, you know, your devotion was to country and, you know, the basically the GWAT that we all devote our 20 years of our lives to and, and, and your job, your career field, your job. Now your devotion is your family. So think about that, apply the same passion to, to your family and all that time that you missed, or in my case, many of our cases maybe screwed up because you just weren't there even when you were there. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, that was good advice. I'm not sure that I fully <laughs> follow it, but I think about it all the time. <laughs> just, um, it hangs out back there. Yeah. Yeah. And it bugs yeah. you because you're not. Cause you're not always getting it right. Yep. Not yep. at all. And then, then yep. <laughs> we all, then we all have things like the Afghanistan withdrawal and, uh, you know, Iraq's still kind of tumultuous and then you, then it rekindles everything. And then, you, then you're sitting questioning, what did I even spend these 20 years for all these kind of stupid things that you really don't need to be doing. Focus on. Yeah. 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 Um, well, um, so coming off of that, <laughs> coming off of that, 
um, we, I told you beforehand, I think it was before we hit record kind of yeah. what our demographic is, right. In terms of, uh, you know, 15 to 30 year olds that are looking to join air force special warfare. But then we also have folks that are just kind of in the private sector doing, doing good work. So, uh, and we always try and close with a advice for those folks. Um, especially the ones that are looking to join our ranks of, you know, TACP, PJCCT, and Special Reconnaissance. So throughout your, you learned a lot, obviously, because you, just from what you've talked about on the podcast, mm -hmm. um, you got a good name for yourself as well. And you, you know how to articulate it because you put it into a book as well. So what kind of advice would you give to those folks that are looking to kind of join Air Force Special Warfare? Um, well, good advice from me based on the story we talked about initially is uh, do a lot of research on um, what you really think you might want to do and uh, and where you might want to go, um, uh, you know, so that you can kind of avoid that back and forth that guys like me have. But you may still have it because we're all a lot of guys join and they're, they, they're obviously all younger and, um, you know, maybe still trying to figure out what they want to do. Um, and I'd say another piece of advice I wish I had heeded through most of my, especially early on in my career is that, you know, these are great career fields. It's, I, I do, would not take back, um, you know, that the feeling of pride I have for serving my country, especially in a time of war, um, uh, but let alone in these, these career fields, the special warfare and special tactics community. Uh, but it's not going to be glorious, um, 99% of the time. Um, and it's not going to be perfect and you're going to have, you're going to have some real trials, not just in like initial, you know, indoctrination and selection, but in your career in general. Um, and you just got to be able to maintain the calm and the storm and, and push through that. Don't let, don't let that stuff hold you back. Oh, um, and that's good. I can get on board with that. <laughs> yeah. You end up having a great career. I think there's, um, you know, even though we're not in the, the heat of GWAT and all of us out there, you know, saving dudes and dropping bombs and everything. There's a lot of expansion in our career fields um, and in the soft community in general. Uh, and there's just a lot of interesting things going on um, beyond just the Middle East, as we know. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. a lot and it's tough because you try and you try and convey that on here, right. On an unclassified platform that's going out to, to, you know, at least 15 people and, um, <laughs> right. And, uh, you're like, I, I tell, uh, I'm telling you there's things that are going on right now. Just here comes yeah. the comments. What, yeah. But what stuff, what stuff yeah. specifically is it? It's like, what dude, stuff? it's like, just, I take our word for it. Like say, yeah. we got three dudes on here that have been hitting the head a bunch of times. Just like, listen <laughs> to us. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Wes, appreciate you joining us, uh, coming on, telling your story. Uh, hopefully, w what we've gotten from this from uh, quite a few people is this is kind of a, a good therapy session for, for folks just to get it out or, or a good um, just way to kind of rekindle and remember in a, yeah. in a positive, some, sometimes negative way. So um, where can folks find you? Uh, well... I mean, I've got a, a website, westjbryant.com, and then I'm all on uh, on LinkedIn. I've got like a Twitter and Instagram, but I don't I just if I publish something, I'll put it on there. But I'm not really all that active on them. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so yeah. check um, the the site again is westjbryant.com. Um, yep. Your books on Amazon, Hunting the Caliphate, um, and then you got another one coming, maybe. I do, I'm, you know, I've got to finish it, but I've been working on it for about three and something year, three years and some change. Uh, but, you know, my goal is to finish it and get it, have it fielded, hopefully get it picked up for publishing here this year, probably be the end of this year. But um, Well, you're not allowed back on the podcast until you finish it. So there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have that real dangling that carrot. Oh my you. goodness. He's like, oh my, I'm going to get right on it. Yay. <laughs> yeah.
Great, guys. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, so, again, Wes, appreciate you joining us. Everybody out there, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that uh, notification bell, then check us out. Get some merch over at onesready.com. And uh, if you can, find time, leave us a review. Good, bad, ugly, whatever. Uh, we'll take it, and then we'll move on. All right. Light up. Let it go.